have to introduce today um, Brown Leffler, who works at the at the Grand Valley State University. Uh, Ronald works in the areas of philosophy of language and philosophy of mind, especially he's interested in belief ascriptions and the philosophy of von Brandom. He recently published a book about von Brandom. Um, today's talk will be partially about inferentialism as well, and partially it will be about the topic that was discussed here by Professor Steckler and Professor Rizio as well, um, kind of re-attitude to um, And uh, thank you very much for inviting me um, it's a, and for coming to this talk. It's a, it's a real pleasure and honor to be here. I'm delighted. And so uh, I'm not going to talk much about inferentialism actually today, uh, about, 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 about new attitudes and belief descriptions. So my topic is this, uh, the ability of speakers to track, to aim at, and to evaluate their interoculars beliefs and epistemic statuses in the course of a conversation. Right? Uh, so when we converse with each other, when we discourse using public language, uh, we not only express our own beliefs and understand the linguistic performances exchanged, interpret them in a certain way, nor do we only change our interoculars beliefs and epistemic statuses in certain ways by speaking, of course they change in systematic interaction with a conversation, but speakers also have to be able to track such changes in belief and epistemic statuses in their interlocutors, at least to some extent. That's an essential part of being a competent uh, linguistic practitioner. And I want to focus in particular on uh, one kind of speech, assertion, uh, tracking belief and epistemic statuses, mainly belief in the context of uh, making assertions. So sometimes, uh, this ability to track belief and epistemic status this is called scorekeeping. David Lewis and Robert Brand use this term in different senses, and it, it, it's supposed to indicate tracking of belief and evaluating of belief of one's interlocutors. I shall call it mutual recognition in a social practice, and that's my topic. And I shall focus on what uh, I'm going to elaborate that on the core of mutual recognition. Mutual recognition and social practice is extremely complicated and it's different for different modes of speech, uh, but there are certain very elementary uh, uh, ways of tracking and evaluating each other's beliefs, uh, which are uh, in invariant across many, many, uh, uh, many topics, uh, um, across many, many um, uh, topics when they, when they use assertion. And, that, and that's, uh, I shall call this the core. So just to indicate what I mean by the core here, this is all three theoretical symbols. Uh, Jane, this is supposed to be Jamie on the left, uh, asserts to dig that it will rain soon. So part of Jane's activity, uh, just pre-theoretically speaking, so by making her assertion, Jane uh, tries to get Dick to believe or to accept that it will rain soon. So Dick, uh, 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 that Jane's horns in on Dick's belief. She's aspiring to get Dick to believe this. Uh, she does that, pursue this aim, in a, in, a, in, a, in a manner that is completely transparent to her and Dick. She does not manipulate Dick in any way or, or flip a switch to make him believe it. It's just she, she's up to changing his belief and is very open about it. That's part of, her, of her, uh, uh, what's going on in her mind when she performs that speech act. And then also, by performing that speech act, she gives Dick a reason to form a belief that it will rain. So, uh, moreover, her performance, uh, her assertion is done against a vast background of common ground, of beliefs and assumptions that are not only shared by Jane and Dick, but that are commonly and mutually recognized by Jane and Dick as shared. It's perfectly open to both of them that they share those beliefs, and in particular, it's, it's perfectly transparent and open uh, uh, that they share this belief from Jane's perspective. So these are uh, aspects of common ground. Then it's raining now, they both believe it, and they know it, that they both believe it. It's completely transparent. That we are in a room together, trivial beliefs, that we are speaking English, etc., etc. We don't bother usually to say these things because they are taken for granted in the conversation. Right, right. So these are the things I mean by, uh, I mean, I'm going to offer a, a more specific 
uh, account of what I mean by the core of mutual recognition, but these are the kinds of things I have in mind here. Now, as many of you know, there's a standard, widely accepted approach to recognition of uh, common ground in a social practice, going back to Grice, and inspired by Grice. It's not only <coughs> for Grice, but it's then Pinter's uh, building on that. And that uh, account of recognition of the core, uh, of, of the core mutual recognition, is done in terms of higher order thoughts. Very complicated, higher order thoughts involving the psychological concept of belief, and other psychological concepts, intention. So, for example, according to Grice, uh, when we assert that belief, this is what we do as part of the assertion, he actually defines assertion that for any speaker S, and we hear H, and S asserts that P, only if first S intends that H will believe that P in response to the performance, as it tends that H will believe that S has that intention, the first one, and as it tends that H is believed that S has that, it, that first intention, will be a reason for H to believe that P. So for the simplest, most humdrum assertions, uh, uh, according to the Gricean analysis, speakers do uh, form these kinds of very complicated higher order intentions, right? I mean, and what we and what see here, those are fourth order intentions about the other's beliefs regarding one's own attention, intentions regarding one's own beliefs. So cognitively, if that's what's really going on, it's very complicated. Moreover, as far as recognition of common ground is concerned, uh, there's an analysis due to Stephen Schiffer, uh, to recognize the proposition that Q is common ground for, for a speaker involves that S believes that Q, believes that the other believes that Q, Q that believes, believes that the other believes that oneself believes that Q, believes that the other believes that oneself believes that the other believes that Q, and so on and so on. Will these, these uh, meta-beliefs of ever higher order involving the concept of belief are supposed to account for this utter transparency? It's transparent to us uh, that we have common ground, right? Uh, so, my starting assumption is that as, if, if it's merely intended as a rational reconstruction of what is going on, then we master the core of mutual recognition. This, uh, this account in terms of meta beliefs or higher order thoughts involving psychological concepts is fine. Something is going on when we recognize common ground, and we may re rationally reconstruct it in the sense, well, if we had to say in meta-representational terms what a speaker does when he or she masters common ground, then, well, we may get these Gricean kinds of intentions or these, these chains of higher order beliefs. Right? So as a rational reconstruction, it's fine. Uh, but there are two stronger claims that are often associated in the literature with that, with that, with that first. Uh, many people, Bryce himself, Schiffer uh, originally, others, uh, try to define various aspects of speech in terms of these uh, uh, higher order thoughts involving psychological concepts, these Gricean intentions. Right? So you may define assertion, try to define assertion in, in terms of these higher order thoughts, or linguistic meaning, or linguistic conventions. Uh, so that is often part of the project. I want to be neutral here in this talk. Uh, about this project. I, I neither endorse it nor reject it. It's fine if someone wants to do that. Uh, uh, okay, so I'll set it aside. Another stronger claim is that the approach in terms of higher order thought that I illustrated on the last slide, uh, uh, slide not only rationally reconstructs the core of mutual recognition, but also offers more or less the accurate psychology of that core. So that is stronger in the sense that this claim is saying we really form these higher order intentions and chains of higher order beliefs when we, when we master the core of mutual recognition. And that claim is highly problematic. As even friends of the Gleisian approach uh, concede, uh, there are uh, many uh, empirical psychological problems with that and also conceptual problems. On the empirical psychological side, I mean, what's often uh, mentioned is that um, what seems intuitively true, children of age three are able, at least to some extent, to participate in a social practice. They perform assertions and they understand them. But it's highly doubtful that they are able, if for, for ordinary humdrum talk, to perform <laughs> rising communicative intentions of the fourth order, right? 
uh, and there's empirical evidence that they actually don't do that. So many people uh, who are friendly to the Gricean program are troubled with that. Uh, and then on the conceptual side, so even, even if we could and would form these higher order thoughts whenever we communicate, uh, Searle, so for example, has argued regarding recognition of common ground, that even if finite, finite minds like ours were able to form an infinite chain of meta-beliefs of ever higher order, it would still not add up to the transparency that is required for recognition of common ground. So there's, there are some reasons for, uh, for conceptual issues as well. Uh, but then if that's the case, if, if the higher order thought approach is problematic, we need an alternative. Because that approach rationally reconstructs, at least so I assume, I'm, I'm sympathetic to that what's going on. And so if, if there are these conceptual and empirical psychological problems with the higher order thought approach, we need a more a, a, a better more, uh, more attractive psychology at the core of mutual recognition. And my goal in the remainder of this talk is to develop such a theory. Specifically, I, I would like to develop uh, an account of the psychology of the core of mutual recognition that for first order uh, discourse attributes no higher thoughts or thoughts at all to the participants. But it, that is such that if it is rationally reconstructed in terms of higher order thoughts, it gives us approximately the kind of price of higher uh, uh, intentions and chains of meta beliefs. And my key idea is uh, well, what I'm going to do is to de I'm, I'm going to spend a, a good deal of the talk developing a theory of belief as a propositional attitude. My key idea is that uh, beliefs qua cognitive attitudes intrinsically contain a certain dimension of mutual recognition. So just by forming any beliefs at all, more specifically, in virtue of the nature of the attitude, cognitive attitude that belief is, we recognize others, at least rudimentarily, already as toxastic and epistemic creatures. So it's already intrinsically a, a social record, dimension of social recognition is still into belief. Well, and since this dimension is a feature of belief qua cognitive attitude, and since cognitive attitudes, qua attitudes, are not conceptual, beliefs are conceptually contentful only in virtue of the content that P, but the fact that it's a belief that doesn't add anything to the content that P. So if there is this dimension of mutual recognition built into belief qua attitude, then that it, we have a, 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 now a way of thinking of recognizing others, at least rudimentarily, as toxastic creatures unmediated by any concepts and in a fortiori, unmediated by higher order thought. Uh, so and then I want to indicate, or at least outline, I want to argue that speaker's mass of what I would call a core of mutual recognition, just to, due to this intersubjective dimension built into belief by attitude. My point of departure will be uh, Wilfred Sellers' theory of re-intention. So at some point I have to uh, outline Sellers' theory of re-intention and using this conception of re-intention as a model to think about belief. So in my roadmap, uh, I want to say a little bit more about the kind of fragment of assertional practice discourse that I want to focus on, very simple kind of discourse called basic assertional practice. And I want to bring out more precisely what I mean by the core mutual recognition. Then I want to introduce a theory of re-intentions and their expressions. That's going to be my model for my theory of belief. I extend then in the third part that model to belief and basic assertional practice and then uh, uh, of our arguments that uh, once we have that, we have the core of mutual recognition. And then lastly, I want to make some comments on the role of higher order thought um, in this course. So two qualifications. First, I mean, as, as Professor Eichel indicates, I'm not denying that we, cognitively normal, uh, developed humans, are able to form higher order thoughts about belief and actually that, that's very important uh, for many reasons. For example, discursive repair, uh, identifying reliable teachers and learners, uh, maybe, maybe hashing out uh, situations of, of disagreement in such a way that communication doesn't break down. So higher all of all is really important. Um, uh, um, I only 
deny that it's it's uh, important in order to master the core of mutual recognition. Right? And then I also throughout the talk, I, I, I assume that we are talking about cognitively normal humans. I, at some point, I will have to say something about uh, people on the autism spectrum, uh, high functioning autists, for example, and other kinds of cognitive uh, abnormalities. Uh, I have nothing to say uh, here about that. All right. Sip of water. I want to just bring into a little sharper focus what I mean by basic assertion of practice, the kind of discourse I want to focus on. And bring out uh, more fully what I mean by the call of mutual recognition. So by basic assertion of practice, I simply mean cognitively particularly undemanding fragment of discourse involving assertion. So these are features of basic assertion of practice. In basic assertion of practice, every assertion is sincere and successful. I just assume that it's sincere, so every assertion expresses belief. Or by making the assertion speaker expresses a belief, right? I take that to be sincere assertion. So by successful, I mean the assertion is interpreted in the same way by all the interlocutors. So it's not part of, of success that the assertion goes through, is accepted. But it is hard that everybody understands it in the same way. So we have uh, simple subject matters are the only subject matters in basic assertional practice. Think of a three or four year old. Right? I mean, so talk about toys, simple social roles, mother, father, teacher, maybe. Uh, also, some kinds of psychological states like pain or hunger uh, that may be, may be a topic in, in basic assertional practice. Yeah, uh, in basic assertion of practice, uh, no assertion expresses, no implies, no implicates propositions containing doxastic or epistemic concepts. So I don't, I don't want to talk, leave talk about belief in epistemic status is completely aside, because then we have meta representations, I have all thought on the table, and it gets confusing. Right? So that's not part of basic assertion of practice. And then lastly, basic assertion of practice is semantically and pragmatically especially undemanding. So, uh, for example, no counterfactuals, no alethic modal discourse, because arguably being able to engage in this kind of discourse does require forming my all the thoughts, and I don't want to be mocked down constantly by that. Pragmatically undemanding, no complicated uh, non-conventional metaphors or ironies, etc., because that might also involve explicit thinking about the other's mind, right? So I'll set all of this aside, uh, focusing only on, on simple talk, basic assertional practice. And here's what I mean by the core now of mutual recognition a little more precisely. Uh, my starting idea is one due to Robert Stallacre, familiar, I'm sure to many of you. My idea, the idea is that reaching common ground is the immediate goal in basic assertion practice, or at least in most of basic assertion practice. Uh, so, so usually what's done in basic assertion practice is to advance a proposition with a goal that this pro proposition not only be accepted by everybody, but that, that such acceptance be commonly and mutually recognized amongst all the interlocutors. Because the point is sharing information and then acting joint, joint agency based on that shared information, so we need common ground. And so uh, my assumption is that that is the main uh, goal, the immediate goal of assertional practice. Of course, basic, uh, basic assertional practice. Of course, basic assertional practice has other goals too. Uh, uh, that's, that is one goal. Mm -hmm. And then three constraints on uh, basic assertional practice in light of that key idea. And those constraints or principles then bring out what I mean by the call of mutual recognition. First, the presupposition principle. Each participant forms in response to an assertion that P, that she endorses herself and regards as manifestly accepted on all sides, uh, noddings and yeses and all of that, or simply silence letting it go through. Uh, the presupposition that P. So if, if, you, if you assert that P and everybody says yes, then you do, you do not only recognize P as what everybody believes, but you recognize that shared belief, or that, that P is shared in belief, is utterly transparent to every interlocutor. That's what I mean by presupposition. Uh, I mean, sorry, I talked earlier in terms of common ground, right? To presuppose that P is to treat 
three P as common ground. That's that's what I mean. I hope I'm not confusing. I'm talking pragmatic presupposition here. It's all I have a sense. So if, if a speaker reads P as common ground, she pragmatically presupposes that we just turn on. That's one constraint. Then next constraint, novel information principle. A speaker usually asserts that P only if she believes or does not yet presuppose that P, at least in basic assertion of practice, where speakers don't lie. No, also it's not sincere. Uh, so she, uh, she, she asserts what she believes, but what she does not yet treat as commonly and mutually recognized as common ground. Uh, she aims to turn P to common ground, and she pursues this goal, this A, in a commonly and mutually recognized manner amongst all the participants. And then lastly, uh, the normative expectations. Principle: Every speaker treats her assertion that P as a reason for every interlocutor to endorse that P. That's a normal principle. It's of course merely a prima facie reason, uh, at least for sophisticated uh, practitioners like us. There may be overriding reasons against endorsing it, uh, uh, even in, uh, from the point of view of the speaker. But, but an assertion that P, the speaker treats it as a, as a prima facie reason for everyone to endorse what's so. All right, so just to outline what, what I want to do now. I want to account how speakers meet those three principles that I just introduced. <laughs> how they master those three <coughs> principles uh, in basic assertion practice without forming high order thoughts about anyone else's beliefs. And remember, my key idea was to build some dimension of mutual social recognition into the belief attitude itself. So now I have all the thoughts needed. And in order to get there, uh, I would like to go through Sellers, Wilfred Sellers theory of re-intention, using re-intention as a model for belief. So I have to say now some things about Wilfred Sellers theory of intentions. And I don't know how many are familiar here with Sellers' theory of, the inten of intentions. So, okay, uh, some are very familiar, uh, but even, even people who are familiar with Sellers' work often are not familiar with Sellers' practical philosophy. So, um, so here's some background with Sellers' theory of intentions and their expressions. The way I interpret it, intentions is, is a technical notion in Sellers. It's, a, it's a, a generic notion that covers all practical propositional attitudes. All, pra all, all propositional attitudes that have a motivational component for action. So desires would be intentions in Zeller's technical sense, volitions, preferences, all of those have motivational components, and so in the technical sense, there are intentions as much as ordinary intentions in the more usual sense, kind of intentions. Uh, uh, right. And Zeller's uh, analyzes or, or, or develops his theory of intention through an analysis of the linguistic expressions by which speakers express their intentions. And those are shell statements here, shell P, where I mean, so an intention that P may be expressed by a person having that intention by a shell P, where the shell simply expresses the attitudinal aspect, the attitude of intending, and the P, of course, the content intended. Right? So these shell statements do not ascribe intentions to anyone. The shell in particular doesn't do it. It, 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 it expresses one. It's not a description. They would ascribe intentions only if, if the content that P contained the concept of intention. It's part of its content. But, but the shell does not ascribe. And then shells make itself makes a distinction between I intentions and we intentions. Intuitively a contrast between intentions that we form uh, as private persons in pursuit of private personal goals <laughs> versus intentions, the intentions that we form when we act as members of a group or on behalf of a group. So there are two kinds of intentions, personal private intentions and, and, and group intentions. Two kinds. <coughs> what lies between those kinds of intentions is a normative constraint according to Sellers. So by stipulation, the only normative constraint on personal intentions, I intentions, uh, is inter intrapersonal internal coherence. So for example, if you personally prefer that the windows be closed right now, right, and that preference can be more or less rational. So 
uh, it can be assessed in terms of rationality relative to your background beliefs, what's going on in the room here, for example, as well as, rel as, well as relative to other preferences that you have. How, is it, how does it rank with your other preferences as a national, right? And so we can, we can assess your, your personal preference that the window be closed. Um, but in light of the collateral intentions and beliefs that you have as more or less rational. And that's what I mean by intra-personal internal coherence. <coughs> so those high intentions are rational, or maximally rational, that are maximally intra-personal and internally coherent. Um, one consequence of this limit, and this is the only normative constraint on, on high intentions, on personal intentions according to cells. The only normative constraint is intra-personal uh, uh, coherence. One consequence of this that there is no normative constraint without <coughs> which intrapersonal internal coherent system of eye intentions to adopt. There are infinitely many possible systems of eye intentions that are, that are coherent. Right? And since the only normative constraint is intrapersonal coherence, there is no norm that tells us, as far as we've, we've heard so far, which of those infinitely many systems we should adopt. And in that sense, uh, one, adopting one in internally coherent system of eye intentions could believe uh, rather than another equally coherent one cell says is arbitrary. So then we have an analysis, well it's actually just a cute notation here, it's not much of an analysis. So statements expressing eye intentions that we have this form, shell sub i that p girl sub i expresses the personal mode of the intention and indicates the normal constraint uh, um, on eye intentions. Now, uh, importantly, this not limitation in normative constraint on eye intentions, the fact that they are only to be assessed regarding whether or not they, they, they fit into a coherent system, that normative constraint is a feature of the attitude of eye intentions not of the content intended. And why is that? Well, because the content intended may not just be a content of an eye intention, it could be the content of other kinds of cognitive states which do have additional normative constraints. It could be the same content, so the same content could be belief, for example. And belief, as we will see, has more normative constraints and then just intrapersonal coherence. So it can't be due to the content that we that eye intentions are limited in the, in, in, in the normal constraints operating on them. It's got to be due to them qua attitudes. One consequence of this limited normative constraint is that two people who express to each other I intentions that are mutually incompatible, interpersonally incompatible, or for such situations do not impose any additional normative constraints on the speaker. So suppose Jane, I intends that the window will be open, Dick, I intends that the window will be closed, and they express that to each other. Now the two I intentions are incompatible in the sense that it's not possible to realize both states of affairs at the same time. Right? They're clearly incompatible. But Jane's eye intention may be perfectly intrapersonally uh, coherent or maybe part of such a system, and so maybe Dick's, and there's no more, nothing more there to evaluate. So this kind of situation, although they, the two have mutually incompatible eye intentions, nonetheless the situation is not one that implies that any mistake has been made by anyone. Only, uh, again, if we build in further assumptions, maybe get situations where the, the situation uh, uh, implies mistakes. So, for example, Jane and Dick may also have further eye intentions that to coordinate their eye intentions as much as possible. They may share that. Now, if they do have that, well, then yeah, yeah now the situation implies a mistake. But it's because of that contingent matter in, in background eye intention due to which the situation yields mistake. By itself, per se, there's no mistake here. So by contrast, belief manifestly intrapersonally intra incompatible beliefs 
or a manifest in incompatibility in belief, thus implying the state I somewhere. There's a major contrast between belief and uh, I intention. Suppose that Jane now believes that the window will be open, the belief about the future, and Dick believes that it, uh, the window will be closed. Now this, that situation, but just by itself, implies that some mistake here is going on. One of those beliefs is mistaken. And most broadly, uh, the situation, I mean, at least Sellers thinks so, and I'm very sympathetic to that, although there's a step here to here, Jane, in the situation of disagreement here, imposes a prima facie obligation on Jane and Dick to negotiate uh, and find a resolution regarding their beliefs. It's a, of course, it's a prima facie obligation only. They may have, may have more important things to do than to talk about the future state of the window. Right? So it may easily be overridden by, by more pressing concerns, but it's a, it's a prima facie obligation to negotiate. So, and that is in place even if Jane's beliefs and Dick's beliefs each is part of an ideally internally intrapersonally coherent system. The source of this uh, 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 prima facie obligation is that beliefs aren't merely correct or incorrect relative to intrapersonal collateral beliefs, coherence, but also correct or incorrect just by themselves, true or false, right? And so Dick holds that the window will be closed, true. Jen holds that the window will be open, true. They can't both be true because the, the contents are, are mutually compatible. And so, so we get mistake and obligation to hash it out from a major obligation. So Sell's master question is how would I intentions have to be transformed to have that potential for interpersonal disagreement? So he looks for a kind of I uh, uh, for a kind of intention that captures that feature that belief has. And just in one minute, a little background. I mean Sellers tries is interested in offering a theory of moral judgment, according to which moral judgments are motivational, they motivate action. And yet, they are correct, uh, objectively correct or incorrect per se, like belief. Belief doesn't have a motivational tie to action according to Sellers things, right? So, so it can't believe, moral judgments according to Sellers cannot be beliefs. Intentions do have that motivational tie, so they, uh, uh, intentions can be moral judgments, but then he is a Kantian and he wants objectivity in the moral realm, and I intentions don't give you this kind of objectivity, so, so he, like, he looks to transform intentions in such a way that we have both a motivational tie to practice and the possibility of situ situations of interpersonal disagreement. And so, uh, how can we get I intentions of this, uh, uh, sorry, intentions of that kind? And so his response is that, well, that those would have to be intentions that, have, uh, that are formed by, by the ancients in a certain intersubjective mode, in the first person plural mode, which he analyzes as such. So, so these are we intentions, those are intentions with that mode. Um, Jerry, we intends that the window will be open. Dick, we intends that it will be closed, right? I mean, those are intentions, but not private ones. They are done from a purportedly public or shared point of view. And so those things that this is how we get interpersonal disagreement. The intuitive idea is that Jane and Dick now intend from a purportedly shared public view point of view, and hence, if they manifestly hold uh, a mutually compatible intention, they so facto disagree. Uh, and again, the, the interpersonal model is a feature of the, the intention qua attitude, not qua content for the state. Uh, this is my interpretation of Sellers, by the way. I mean, I'm looking forward to reading Jeremy Kuhn's book, who is just written the first book on Sellers' Practical Philosophy and so on, I'm looking forward to reading that, but that is, that is how I understood it when I started with it. Uh, so here's a minor elaboration, what I think, I, mean, I don't know whether Sellers actually said that anywhere, but this is what he should have said in light of what he wants to do. So, of course, we intention, right? We want to say a little more sharply what it means to we intend that P. So my, my interpretation is that in taking the attitude, a cognitive attitude that we intend towards P, the content that P, the H lipso factor treats that content as what is take as to be made true by us together. Something that we jointly are to make true. Okay. Just by taking the attitude towards P, the agent treats P 
like that is something that is to be made true to them. Uh, of course, the innovation does not conceptualize that. It's built into the attitude. But if we have to describe what's built into the attitude, we have to use these concepts. Uh, so this treatment of P is not conceptual because it's a feature of we intention by attitude, not by content for the state. The attitudes are not conceptual. Uh, I also take it that the agent's sense of togetherness, of us jointly, is simpliciter. The agent doesn't count noses, I and you and they and me and he and then us, putting it summatively, but, but the we is simpliciter in that sense. Why is it simpliciter? Well, if it's, if it's additive in some sense, then we have to have logical means built into, into cognitive attitudes. That doesn't sound so good. Um, so we have a conjunction, maybe on other means. Still, so we have a sense of us together from the point of view of the we intending agent due to the nature of we attitudes or the we intention. And then the one large question is whether that implies that the we intending agents merge into group minds. Uh, Sellers thinks no, and I, I think he can say that, uh, even on that interpretation of my elaboration. If we sharply distinguish between the agent's point of view and the point of view of theory onto agents, from the agent's point of view, P is to be made true together by us. <coughs> the agent treats P as that simply by taking that attitude towards that content. Right? But from the theoretical point of view, from the point of view of a theory of, of we intention, it's clear that each agent holds a token we intention alone. So when you and I, we intend together that the window be closed, there are two token we intentions, one in your mind and one in my mind. It's not that you and I merge into some kind of group mind that holds the we intention. Right? So if we shall make this distinction, we can I think, avoid group mind. Not that I have strong metaphysical uh, uh, anxieties about group minds, but I don't, I don't think we can do that. So observation. Agents who converse via these shall be statements, agents who express the we intentions and understand each other's expressions, they recognize each other as intending agents <laughs> to the extent that they treat each other as agents responsible to make true certain contents that think. Right? I mean, the intention has this interpersonal mode built into the attitude, this we mode, and so if anyone comes along, the agent forming the we intention recognizes that person as part of the we. And, 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 and as, a, as, a, as, a, as a we intending agent, as somebody responsible to make true the content intended. So we have some rudimentary recognition of others as we intending agents. And that, since that's built into the, the, the intention quite attitude, it does not involve my own thought. I'm trying to write, I'm talking too long after that. So I'm going to say the minutes, but the minutes plus something. I hope to leave enough time for discussion. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. Wait, wait, wait. okay. So 20, 25 minutes for a talk. Okay. That would be easy. So now, uh, remember my goal is to uh, offer a theory of belief according to which to believers as such already recognize others as toxastic creatures unmediated by how the thought. And so, of course my point of departure is self-theory of the intentions, naturally. So I want to think of belief as an, 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 an analogous to the way I propose we should think about the intentions, so I'll say the intentions. So I, I propose that we treat beliefs as propositional we attitudes in the analogous sense as well. So belief qua attitude has this we mode built in. And uh, so in specifically, in taking the belief attitude towards P, the belief in P, the agent is a factor. Just by taking the attitude, treats that content as to be taken true together. Not to be made true together, because we're talking belief, not intention, but to be taken true. Something that ought to be shared, something that ought to be endorsed. Uh, due to belief by attitude, right? And it's built into the attitude. We take that attitude towards people and we treat everybody. Uh, as why everybody should take true. And then we treat basic assertions 
Remember, I'm talking about basic assertional practice, very simple kinds of discourse, between basic assertions that be as expressions of belief that P so conceived. And so this would be my little notation. I mean, lying on Sellers here, the explanation mark stands for, for assertion or for expression of belief, rather. The we, uh, we don't, it expresses the interpersonal mode built into that attitude, and the P expresses the content. Strictly speaking, we don't need that we here, because I want to say that all beliefs have this interpersonal mode built into them. So whereas in, in case of intention, we have the contrast between personal intentions and interpersonal ones, or the intentions and our intentions, all beliefs, I take it, uh, have this we mode built into them. Um, why is that? Well, the motivation is this. Belief, everybody agrees, as a first brush, is the attitude of holding truth. And we believe that we hold it true. But what's true is true for everybody. And so, uh, when we believe that P, we treat P as what's true for everybody. At least that's how it can be elaborated. And actually, this is how I want to elaborate. What, what it means to treat P as true for everybody is to treat P as something that is to be taken true to the world by everybody. So, there are no other beliefs. Those are the only beliefs. And so, all beliefs have we not spill into that. So this here is an expression of belief in basic assertional practice. And well, I mean, since in basic assertional practice, all assertions express beliefs. All basic assertions have this form. But I don't mean this to be a definition of assertion in general, nor even of basic assertion. It's not a definition of assertion. All right? That's very important. It can't be a definition of assertion, because not all assertions express belief and rely on express beliefs. And it can't, it would, I mean, that would be really bold to offer this as a definition of basic assertion. Even. I mean, there's a lot of literature on how to best define assertion, right? And like the, like knowledge norms or, or commitment approaches. So, so I don't want to rule out that these are the right kinds of approaches towards assertion. So I'm offering this as a definition of even basic assertion, let alone of assertion. But basic assertions are those kinds of expressions. So pay off then, basic social practitioners recognize each other as rational doxastic creatures to the extent that they advance certain contents that P has to be taken true together. And they, when they perform these shell statements, they understand these shell statements, right? They advance P as what we hold true, should hold true together. And then any one of the we is recognized as someone bound by that normative expectation or subject to that normative expectation and then to that extent the belief on record and, and, and the server basic assertor recognizes the interlocutors as toxic creatures. No I have our thoughts, I claim, needed because it's a feature of uh, no I have our thoughts in all the and epistemic concepts because it's due to the attitude held and expressed. I make one more assumption. So, I, so basic assertional practitioners are, of course, linguistically competent, so they understand what others say. So I assume that even a participant who does not yet believe him or herself that P, but understands uh, 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 someone else, uh, uh, someone else's assertion that P, understands that basic assertion as an advancement of the content that P in this course as something that is to be taken true together as part of a linguistic competence. Okay. Whether she believes that in herself or not. So when we, I mean, if, if you tell me something about what's going on in the department here, and I, I, I have, of course, no idea about gossip and, and things that, that are going on, right? I, then by, by understanding your assertion about what's going on in the department, I uh, take the contents that you advance as something that are as contents that are to be taken true together, even though I don't take them true myself yet. So now remember, I want to account for the core of mutual recognition and assertion of practice of three principles. Is 
that these, this kind of implicit mutual recognition that of each other as toxastic creatures that believers have in the of the nature of the belief attitude suffices to master the core of mutual recognition in a social practice. We do have this stuff on the handout, right? Those three principles, so that they meet those three principles. Um, so let's start with the normative expectation principle. What does that say? Every speaker treats her assertion that P, in basic assertion practice, every speaker treats her assertion that P as a reason for every interlocutor to endorse that P. So suppose Jane asserts in basic assertion practice into a So Jane advances the content that it will rain soon, they have to be taken through together. by making that assertion. And if an interlocutor refuses, does not accept it, does not endorse that it will rain soon, uh, <coughs> that situation involves from Jane's point of view, and sim similarly from, from the point of view of the other, there's some kind of mistake. There's some tension here. That it will rain soon is advanced as to be taken through together. So there's some kind of normative expectation built around that and someone does not uh, um, follow through with that normative expectation, does not abide by it, so something is wrong. Either that person should uh, uh, heed to the normative expectation and form a belief in response, then it's fine. Or Jane should withdraw her assertion to get, so to speak, this normative force out of the discourse. And so uh, that gives the interlocutor then a reason, a prima facie reason to accept Jane's assertion. That it will rain soon is advances to be taken through together, and that provides a reason to accept that. So en passant, Jane treats every interlocutor as having a reason to accept that it will rain soon, and it's much more assertion. So then we have the presupposition principle. No higher authority needed, I claim. Right? It's a position principle. Each participant forms in response to an assertion that, he, that she endorses herself and regards it manifestly accepted on all sides the presupposition that, in other words, uh, yeah. uh, that's that principle. Sorry, I should have had it on the slide again. So, so if I assert that P, and I recognize science amongst my interlocutors, indicating acceptance, yeses or nots, or maybe further assertions that are based on what I just asserted. And these public signs, together with my belief that P, I claim, are sufficient for me to now treat P as common ground, as something that is not only shared by us, but the sharedness of which is utterly transparent between all of us. So suppose Jane says, if you go in soon, going back to earlier, and Dick says, okay, oh, okay. So after Dick's confirming, okay, Jane treats now the content that it will rain soon, as correctly and jointly take it through together by her and Dick. And I want to say, I mean, you guys can press me on that. Um, I have to think hard about that myself. I want to say that because Jane treats that it will rain soon as what we should jointly endorse simplicity. No discrimination between I and I and thou. I want to say that that plus things made the signs confirming acceptance suffices not only for her to recognize that content as jointly accepted by her and Dick, but as such that this joint acceptance is utterly transparent. To, to Jane, uh, uh, from, from Jane's point of view, to Jane and Dick. So, so we get this kind of transparency that is the characteristic of common ground. So in general, I would say this to presuppose that P, to treat P as common ground, in basic assertion of practice, the following two conditions are sufficient. 
as the leaves that be, and maybe a surat sati, maybe I need to add a surat that be, as the leaves that be, and as detects public science among the interlocutors, by that we are never to confirm the joint acceptance of P. Of course, this course is a wash with, with such signs. Yeses and nods and just the, the way the, co the course of the conversation moves on indicates, uh, manifests whether or not someone has accepted what you, what you asserted. All right, uh, again, no higher order thoughts I claim needed here for the basic circle practice. Then the, the NIP, novel information principle. Remember the principle is this, a speaker usually asserts that P only if she believes, but does not yet presuppose or treat as common ground that P aims to turn the content that P into something that is presupposed or treated as common ground and pursues this goal, this aim, in a common way usually recognized manner. So here's an assumption. So we are talking first of all the believers here having lots of beliefs, and then some contents believed in this course, some of those contents are confirmed as accepted by the other participants. Those are the contents the speaker not only, uh, the participant not only believes, but also presupposes or treats as common ground. Many other contents believed are such that there are no Science, public science amongst the interlocutor indicating that the belief is accepted. So, so speakers implicitly bifurcate the belief system in, uh, uh, in, into, into two parts. The part that consists in mere belief, not yet common ground, and the part that is not mere belief but also common ground. And then speakers tend to aim to turn a content that P from a content that is merely believed into one that is presupposed or treated as common ground. And, uh, hence, they tend to assert those kinds of contents, the merely asserted, uh, merely believed contents, in order to meet the felt requirement stemming from his or her own belief attitudes regarding P, that P is something that has to be taken true together. Right? P is to be taken true together from the point of view of the believer, and so if there are signs indicating that this normative expectation is not fulfilled, then that provides motivation for the speaker to assert it in order to garner such signs amongst the interlocutors and to turn the income wrong. And then at the end, this is the kind of a one point where you may, may press me and I want to say that this, this aim is pursued in a, in a completely mutually transparent and open manner, no, no manipulation here on the speaker's part. Why not? Why not? Um, because of this, this, this joint we, that is, uh, of which the believer has, as such has a, has a sense, the joiners, the we simplicity, that, that makes it transparent. All right, I'm almost done now. Uh, just some fleeting comments on my own thoughts. So what I take myself to have done here is to offer a, a, a theory of how we recognize common ground in this course in, in, in basic assertional practice, simple kind of discourse uh, of, of how we master the core of mutual recognition, sorry, in this course, without forming any higher or thoughts about each other's beliefs. So we don't need Gracian communicative intentions, nor do we need these chains of meta beliefs. We get all of this due to the interpersonal mode of, the, of belief by attitude and uh, due to the fact that basic assertions are expressions of belief in that sense. Well, that's what I claim and what I have, have tried to articulate. But again, I do not deny that high order thought about belief is very important. And so we certainly can do it, uh, uh, and it's important uh, for many ways. So our basic provisionals, they don't form such high order thoughts. Uh, rather, they simply, well, this is just summary of what, what we've done already so far. Um, so, but, but as, as far as I modeled them so far, the basic practitioners, they are not, uh, I think, they are, these basic practitioners are not yet able to recognize others as believers that P, where they themselves do not hold the belief that P. Um, so, so, is there, 
Yeah. Um, so there are, uh, what I want to say is that there are severe limitations in the way we recognize each other as believers. So the only way to recognize each other as believers is in this implicit mode, built into, in, into belief, while the attitude is severely limited. And so one thing that, that these kinds of believers, as I modeled them, should have trouble doing is recognize someone else as be believing that P, when they themselves do not yet believe that P. Right, I mean, we, uh, we, we can recognize ourselves as believers that P when we recognize them as jointly accepting it in the context of me, myself, believing that P. But if I don't believe in myself, they should have trouble recognizing others as believing that P. They should also should have trouble recognizing others as having false beliefs that P, where they, where they believe not P, and the other believes that P, so false belief uh, should be very difficult at least for them. And my proposal is that, that they, or maybe we, if my story is true, overcome these limitations in recognizing others as believers by acquiring the ability to form higher or thoughts about belief, in addition to this implicit business that I've been talking about. And so we get a hybrid theory of mutual doxastic recognition, in which all our humans recognize each other in doxastic and epistemic respects in two mutually irreducible ways. Implicitly, due to the interpersonal model of their own belief attitudes, and then explicitly due to the ability to form higher level thoughts involving applications of doxastic and epistemic concepts. And that then, I mean, once we have this interplay between the implicit recognition and the explicit, that raises interesting questions. I mean, how in concrete situations, for example, do we recognize each other as teachers and students, right? There's a source of belief that would be really useful for me to have, I mean, presumably by a higher order thought, uh, but how does that interplay with one's own beliefs? Uh, then, uh, yeah, how do these situations, situations of, uh, of disagreement, how do they work when the explicit and the implicit level uh, 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 um, interplay? And then one interesting question in that neighborhood, how would believers without the ability to form explicit high uh, do in false belief tests? I'm not going to go into that, I've talked way too long already. Uh, but, but then in psychological literature, large literature on false belief, belief tests, different kinds. And so it's really an interesting issue how this theory uh, uh, um, uh, uh, would deal with these kinds of, of, of tests. Let's try this. Suppose 
You believe it, the sun is shining. Okay. I believe the sun isn't shining. So if if we merely if we didn't have the ability to form higher order thought about belief, mm -hmm. it would very quickly yield an unstable social situation, at least on my story, because we normatively expect everybody, including ourselves, to now hold contradicting beliefs just by holding it. I mean, I believe that it's not raining, so I treat that it's not raining as what is to be endorsed together. You, let's say you assume that it's, it is raining, so you advance the contradictory content as to be endorsed together. So if I have no further cognitive resources from my point of view, and similarly if you don't have the resources from your point of view, we would maybe align very quickly one way or another, but we have to resolve that contradiction. Now if we bring meta-beliefs in, I think that helps stabilizing the situation. So suppose I can now, in addition from the meta-belief, mark beliefs that the sun shines. And that is, it is true, that's what you believe, right? Now, on my theory of belief, I form the meta belief, so I treat everybody, uh, or, or I treat the content that Mark believes that the sunshine is something that is to be endorsed together. And you, Mark, better endorse that in that scenario, right? Because if you don't accept that, then I don't know what to do. I mean, it's all, of course, I endorse it too. And similarly for me, I mean, you may not believe about me, Ronald believes that the sun does not shine. So at the meta level, we meet, and then we can represent each other as holding these mutually incompatible first order belief. It keeps the disagreement kind of local and stabilizes the social situation. That's the idea. Yeah, I, I, I'm still wondering how the initial ground level is even possible, right? If, it's, if I've adopted the we attitude that we're taking this true, and you don't have it, then the we attitude seems to be a problem. I mean, I can't have that we attitude anymore. Uh, just as if, you know, my wife says, the window should be open, and I say, no, 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 it should be shut. I mean, it's really hard to maintain a we attitude in the face of that. You know, independent of moving to a metal level, well, she wants it, and I don't. I mean, just right there, this, um, you know, I'm thinking of the team reasoning kinds of cases in, in, in team reasoning game theory. Right? We all have very different individual desires that the team just doesn't ever, it's hard to take the team reasoning you had to, here's it seems like the same thing. I already recognize that you don't, for you know, you can't see the out the window, uh, but I can. It's hard even to see what it would mean, so I can't take the we attitude. So how can I form a belief that it's But in, in belief, I mean, I do want to say that all beliefs are such attitudes. I mean, they, I'm not fully understanding your question, but maybe just a little bit of background that makes it clear, right? I mean, I, and, and this is a motivation, it's not an argument, so belief is holding true. Mm -hmm. What's true is true for everybody. And so I, 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 I assume that believers, by holding P true, have a sense of that P, from their point of view, is true for everybody. Now, of course, P may de facto be false, but from the point of view, believer holding it confidently true, P is true for everybody. And I want to cash out this sense of true for everybody in normative terms as, a, as, a, as, a, as a, a, I mean, as an obligation on everybody to share the belief. I'll shut up a little bit before, but like, that, that's exactly where my worry is, is, is that that's where belief and truth get collapsed. I mean, actually, you heard David Sonia, it seems to me. Mm -hmm. But anyway, yeah, we'll move on. Okay. <laughs> Yes, thank you very much. Uh, uh, at first I thought also that Mark and I and you agree that we have to get rid of a direct access to this higher level intentions and that it's uh, very good uh, at first. Okay, but uh, uh, only a small remark uh, because we have in logic and, and linguistics already a uh, 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 terminological specialization of these oppositions. Uh -huh. I would not use that for okay. the same ground. Uh, because, uh, but that's only a side remark. Now, now uh, uh, two things. The first is this very general notion of intention. That's the first part. I of, uh, oh, okay. Uh, yeah. A very general yeah. one, uh, uh, starting with cells, has a, a danger in it. Mm -hmm. 
the danger is the following. Uh, at, at least in Germany, it's easy to see that uh, to have animal appetite, big yield, does presuppose that I have a propositional attitude. Whereas, uh, uh, and it's a it's a pro attitude, but it's a pro attitude without it, and, that, and therefore, and therefore, it might be already introduced in a too general way. And that's the first point because yeah. animals. Have yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, the the second point is, and it has to do with the with, with the problem. If you, uh, I agree in a certain sense that you can, from the side, describe things by they believe, uh, not I believe, because that would be already higher level. Uh, but uh, in your uh, in your putting things, you you always. Use already the that P clause. Mm -hmm. That P clauses are complicated because they are nominalizations of sentences mm -hmm. with abstracting the content. So you were talking about the content of the piece. And if you do that, you already presuppose something quite complicated, namely the content of sentences or utterances. Which, which are types of a different form as propositions. So you start with propositional attitudes. And if you start with propositional attitudes, for me, at least, it sounds almost as high level as what you want to, what you want to avoid. And uh, uh, just because in these abstractions to, to these bad people who have a whole practice of inferential, inferential pre-knowledge, and it's not so elementary as you might have assumed. Mm -hmm. And I do not know how to how to deal with it, but my worry is that we are treated badly, or we are tricked out very often by these linguistic dialogical analysis with these variables. Uh, not realizing how how high the presumptions already are, mm -hmm. and, and that's my problem. Because agreeing, what does it mean to agree? It, uh, it it would be easy if we would agree with making differentiations here at present, or if saying sentences. And I would say the same, same sentence. But if you already go to agreeing as a propositional attitude, it's not so far away from I believe that. P. <laughs> uh, uh, it's already a proposition I think in that sense, and then you take that out. So uh, thank you for this comment. Uh, just to, just to, to clarify, so is the worry that this kind of propositional attitude and talk into which I engage already presupposes that we are full-fledged linguistic practitioners. Exactly, understanding the context, knowing all the inferences, uh, uh, knowing all the joint inferences, yeah. and then you cannot explain what you want to take. Well, I mean, I mean, one, 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 if I feel one way to look at this, I mean, officially, remember at the beginning I tried to be neutral, whether like yeah. you're taking the rising line or, 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 or your line, uh, in fact, I'm much more sympathetic to that line. I just try to be officially neutral. So perhaps, I mean, if I understand your concern, it's more than a concern to Christians who, who think, uh, uh, I mean, the, the standard Christian, right? Who, who, who thinks that we can have this full blown propositional attitude antecedently to being linguistic creatures. Yeah, so, so I, I mean, I just don't want to be neutral because I don't want these guys to go off my band back in here, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, but, uh, yeah. As to the first comment, uh, with uh, 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 pro-attitudes in animals, and then maybe also proxastic kinds of states in animals, I, 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 um, I, I hope I didn't introduce what I said about belief as a definition of belief in general. I mean, maybe belief is more generic. And all I'm interested in really is the kinds of beliefs that linguistic practitioners are, uh, are, are expressing, performing assertions. So, so, so maybe, I mean, if you are Fodorian, right? Well, it would be linguistic, it would be language of thought. But, but so maybe Jackson map kind of beliefs. Uh, so, so there could be, I don't know. Um, well, I, I, do want, I don't want to be committed to denying that animals don't have belief in any sense. 
so I, I, I don't want to introduce what I said as, 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 as a definition of belief, but only as a characterization of, of the kinds of beliefs when we engage in discourse. Does that help regarding first comment? Um, yes, and, yes and no, because the, uh, uh, I would not have the problem denying uh, higher intentions to animals and, uh -huh. and, and of, of denying that without metaphorical anthropocentric projections we can talk about propositional attitudes to animals because we have we because of the presuppositions of uh, inferential norms we, we introduce in that they can talk as they want but they cannot say that they uh, don't use metaphors if they uh, talk that way and therefore the whole enterprise makes sense in my opinion only if we uh, try to get anthropos anthropomorphisms out of that, and if we do that, we cannot do that without looking more precisely to the linguistic, the outer form of linguistic systems. And therefore, I was against this very early way from words and sentences to propositions, because then you pre presuppose, presuppose this content talk, and that's the reason why this content talk uh, just in the moral way of naturalizing animals means, of course, anthropomorphic right. readings of the animals. It's just the opposite of what they do. And therefore, I think that's why I'm sympathetic, and I hope I can be sympathetic, or even though I try to say you. Yeah, but, but you understand yeah. what my worry comes from. This right. is only an explanation. We don't have to go Thanks. into more details. Watson? I'm very full of question. Uh, at the beginning, you specified that uh, the, the Gracian approach is psychologically implausible, which I agree, which I agree. But then you said that it might at least work as a sort of rational reconstruction, which can even be applied to your own alternative analysis. And what do you mean by uh, the ones you offered this alternative, which is psychologically more uh, plausible than eventually it's at the level of rational reconstruction compatible with the Rice's style. But what does it mean that the Rice style analysis is a plausible rational reconstruction of the core? Well, I mean, maybe I'm not using the term in the way it has currency. What I meant is simply this. I mean, so mutual recognition takes place in assertion of practice. And by rational reconstruction, I meant this, that if we had to explain speaker's ability to this mutual recognition by attributing higher order thoughts to the speaker. If we, if we had to account for the mutual recognition by stipulating that they form higher order thoughts, then the kind of Riesian attribution of, of, of intentions, higher order intentions, would capture important aspects of mutual recognition. I feel sometimes people who are unsympathetic to the Gracian line are too quick in dismissing it. Oh, it's psychologically implausible, so we don't have to deal with this. Yeah. And uh, I think we are making it too easy for yeah. ourselves because something like that is going on. And so, I mean, uh, it, it, in the sense of rational reconstruction, and so if we reject it as a psychologically true story, we have to say something else. Not necessary conditions for right. assertions, absolutely. Right. Yeah. Right. Could be sufficient conditions, I mean, maybe in another world there are creatures who right. do it this way, right? But isn't um, that um, uh, completely adequate grounds for, for rejecting it, right? Because anybody can use sufficient conditions, mm -hmm. right? But if you show them they're not necessary, and they're not necessary for um, beings like us, then what's the interest of the rational reconstruction? Well, it, it could still be a normative constraint on theory building. So assuming that we need a good theory of recognizing common ground. So it should be a theory such that if the kinds of creatures were, uh, uh, did it all that in terms of higher or thought, it should be roughly this. So right, I mean, it, inf it informs. Well, how does that follow? It seems that um, you could equally say, well, then another, but another theory 
one perhaps cons more clearly consistent with the theory that you've given would be a better theory. Uh, well, that's possible. Possible. Sure, no, sure. I mean, I mean that's entirely possible. But I mean, uh, what I want to claim is that my theory is sufficient and that it's more attractive. But I don't know whether well, this is what's really going on. I mean, and actually, then we would have to go into cognitive psychological. Or, I mean, like false beliefs, and other kind. But of I think that's stronger view. Now, if you show that the rational reserve is not necessary, and your view is sufficient, mm -hmm. then we're really done with the rational reconstruction because <laughs> right, we've got. Better is a uh, sufficient account. We have okay. an account that gives sufficient conditions that are not necessary. We have an account that gives sufficient conditions that apparently these are plausibly, that are obviously not necessary. So it seems like you win. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Take care of the slide. Take care of the slide. Just a follow up. I, I hate to be the guy defending Grace here, but. <laughs> so so I, I, I think I'm inclined to think that something you said in the middle of your res response to Mark's most recent comment is, is right. It, it might be that the Gricean thing is useful when we're thinking about the kinds of rich, cognitively sophisticated sorts of creatures that are doing the things they're doing. I mean, Ronald's interested in this, uh, something like a philosophical anthropology. We want to make sure at the ground level that we're not presupposing the kind of things that it looks like three-year-olds can already do. But then there's these other cases where it does seem to me that, so the first thing, 1A here, when you've got speaker and H, where S is, speaker S is trying to communicate something to hearer H, <clears throat> if, if S says P, and I ask S, did you intend that H will believe that P? Mm -hmm. And he says no, looks like something's gone wrong there. That gives some indication that these kinds of higher order things are playing some role. Or at least it could, it's not. could be, I mean, we are notoriously bad to tell what's going, reliably tell what's going on in our own minds, but I mean, it could well be that, in fact, the speaker intended it, but would deny it if I must. That's it. Um, well, I'm still thinking, it just sounds, it just sounds like there's something off with, with someone who does something like that. And again, I'm not a Gracie, but if, but if yeah. you, you know, if a philosophy person says, says, you say P to Mark, and I ask later, did you intend Mark to believe that P, and you say no, then it looks like it's hard for me to make sense of what you were doing as an assertion. That's some support for uh -huh. the thought that uh -huh. Grace is on something. So, and that would then indicate that at least this bit of the Grisian approach is actually. Yeah, it's awesome, telling, right? it's, you know, it's doing something. Again, I'm not, I, I don't want to, I'll, I'll stop with this. But, I'm, but it just seems like you, yeah. there's not nothing to it. Yeah. I have a sort of follow up for this as well. I'm also not Grisian, but I want to. This respect, defending the view a little bit. Because Gracians use the machinery of higher order thoughts to explain pragmatic, uh, pragmatic content, let's say. Mm -hmm. And they can uh, clearly hold the thought that small kids uh, can make assertions, though they are not able to uh, infer or in, uh, make implications, for example. And they cl clearly show that this is something that really works. Communication and they show that at which point at which point they are able to uh, understand pragmatic content and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. So I would not say that the story is um, is that they has to um, um, assume that being Russian means that you assume from from the beginning that you have to understand beliefs uh, have to be able to form a higher form of beliefs. I mean. Uh, I, I share the sympathy to Grice. I think Grice has many things to teach us uh, uh, about about discourse. I mean, in, in particular, the pragmatic, right? I mean, and then I mean, just taking on that project in the time period in which it did is just amazing. Um, but I do want to say, I mean, in the in the in the leading papers of also the early one, I mean, he does aim to define non-natural meaning in terms of those intentions. Exactly. And then, I mean, later on he backpedals and then, I don't mean to people, <laughs> I don't mean to people, uh, or to people, speakers with all kinds of higher order intentions, but it's then hard to see that how, how is it that you're not doing that. Okay. So, that's the early thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I have a follow-up. So, no, no, okay. okay. I don't have a follow-up. Okay, okay. okay. that's, that's uh, uh, look, uh, when we, when we come to the pragmatics of the whole story, then, well, Grice is ambivalent in that, but if you look at Maglia and all these people who, who put it in a theoretical form, then of course they have a problem because they have a certain theory format. 
your approach seems to be to say, look, uh, this understanding of the pragmatic level as a can do is earlier than a can say that. Because that is a nominalization, it just produces a topic to talk about. Mm -hmm. And the whole debate seems to be that we have to talk about contents of P uh, 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 that he believes, that he intends. And this higher level is, of course, logically after being able to use P mm -hmm. and being able to, to use belief that P and so on. So, so any that, if you have a recursive, that in these constructions is higher level and presupposes the lower level. And what the big mistake in Rice is that he jumps immediately from a, from a lower level to all these higher levels, not seeing that these are logical steps which, uh, which correspond to pragmatic steps, which are, have a methodological order, and in my opinion, However, price is good, he didn't see that. And, and, and therefore, I would support your, a pragmatic reading of what you are Pragmatic then in the sense of random models? No, in, in, the sense, in the sense of what all people involved in rule following debates know that we, are, we first are able to do things and then yeah. we can talk about them. And I think if you make that, uh, it, uh, and stress that even more, then it's clear yeah. what you are doing. I mean, once you get an explanation of the of the explicit ability to form exactly, the results, exactly. I mean, yeah. that's clearly what I assume. Exactly, that exactly. The implicit yeah. stuff has to be there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so just a clarification. I'm, I'm not sure that I am getting you right. So, so you say, um, if I understand you correctly, that this curse may proceed and sometimes perhaps does proceed in the way this right by guys involving the higher order ball, but that usually this is not the case because what uh, does the work of higher order activities are the inventions. Okay. And do you mean that uh, the participants of the discourse might even be incapable of the higher order fault? A rising kind or yeah. I mean, I think my, what I defend today is compatible with, with this claim that it's impossible for someone to do that. Aha, uh -huh. uh -huh. okay. Uh -huh. And uh, so, so uh, now we suggest a question which is in the end of your handout. How do believers without the ability to form higher faults do enforce belief tasks? So the question indicates that you think, at least, Think about the possibility that they might pass the false belief task, right? I mean, I have you to think. You consider the possibility. I don't know. Um, I, I have to think more about this aspect, right? I mean, my, my believers who are merely in, able to treat others implicitly as believers, no, no able, capability of higher order for about belief. I have to read up on, on the latest development in false belief that there are different versions and okay. different yeah. interpretations. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's kind of mind boggling, boggling to mm -hmm. imagine how a person without these higher order flaws could pass the false belief task. I think so too, and that's what originally motivated it. It's okay. a really intriguing question mm -hmm. to ask, an obvious question, right? I mean, but then the question is in the in the non-verbal, I mean for those of you who are familiar, the non-verbal false belief stars, I mean, okay. why do they? Stay okay. longer at Maxi. Maybe yeah, he looks yeah. for the chocolate in the place where it actually is. So I will have to say something. I mean, uh, I'm glad that I'm not committed to any specific interpretation mm -hmm. of the belief class. I mean, my, my fallback is always to say, well, I mean, all right, if it can't, if, if, if the merely implicit mutual recognition doesn't explain the data, I can always say, well, they already have rudimentary higher order abilities. So. So it, it seems to me that you would need to have, in order for them to pass some reasonable false belief task, and this theory of false belief task are methodologically a bit complicated, uh, you would have to allow for some other understanding of different perspectives, co conflict with okay. toxicity. And your own model, which is at the level of uh -huh. agreeing uh -huh. toxicity perspective, it seems to me, because you argue that in order to recognize different toxic perspectives yeah. completely, you have to have this higher order thoughts. Uh -huh. So I don't see you know, how on your model the kids could pass 
Or somebody could pass the standard block for the lift task without having some kind of high or down um, thoughts. On your own model, I can imagine something. But, 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 but the model kind of always involves the counter movement from the pressure positions that everybody did it the same to a differentiation. So there may be some kind of room for for confidence. I'm thinking, for example, I mean, maybe they are able to mentally simulate other toxastic perspectives using but, their own toxastic perspectives. There are different models of this. Uh, there, are, there is some developmental literature which differentiate proto beliefs for food, from food law okay. beliefs, and the proto beliefs looks very much like your own uh -huh. beliefs, mm -hmm. yeah. which is that basically that they kind of can recognize the beliefs on our part, on, that, on, the, on their, their own part, and other part, but not conflict. That's the first stage, and then come to later stage, which is the full one, full lift task, and then they already recognize different perspectives. So maybe you have something in between, which in developmentally might make some sense. All the people like that some wouldn't call it belief. We still have time for one question, maybe. Is there any? Only a short term of preparing. Just to say to these guys, they are very skeptical to this anthropomorphic attribution of false belief readings because uh, if there is a gap in the observation, it can be just astonishment or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and so they start immediately, immediately with high theories that put into the brain and they have to calculate, but that's a presumption which. Well, you can believe it, but it's a very high presumption. You mean that Thomas O'Reilly uh, wouldn't agree with this rich interpretation of the... Yes, they form. would just say that it's just methodological yeah, but, 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 but the problem is that the last year they themselves published paper I mean. in which they claim that primates are capable of passing for the test and they are obviously not about this. Yeah, it's the theory theory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's the theory theory. It's not so much... Uh, 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 of course, of course, it's a task to, to, to uh, interpret these uh, observational facts, and, it, and the interpretation is the problem, not so much the, the facts. Mm -hmm. Okay, there are no questions again. Thank you.